really delighted to have uh, the first um, speaker, one of the speaker for our spring semester. And um, I'm going to do my usual uh, uh, invitation to our reception that will follow this entire event. We have a wine and cheese reception. Um, and I want to introduce uh, Len, who will uh, who will introduce our speaker, and he is the uh, Associate Director of the Center uh, for, at least for spring. Sorry. Thanks. Welcome. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest today. Uh, Melissa Schwartzberg is Associate Professor of Politics at New York University. She's the author of two books, Democracy and Legal Change, uh, from Cambridge University Press in 2007, and Counting the Many. The Origins and Limits of Supermajority Rule, also from Cambridge in 2014, as well as numerous articles in leading journals, including articles on Athenian democracy in the American Political Science Review, um, So General Will in Political Theory, and Jeremy Bentham in the Journal of the History of Ideas. Uh, she currently holds an Andrew W. Mellon New Directions Fellowship and serves as the co-editor of NOMOS. Uh, the annual yearbook of the American Society for Political and Legal Philosophy. Uh, Professor Schwartzberg is an inspiring scholar um, studying political rules in constitutional democracies, and I think her work pushes us to think in a sophisticated way um, about the intersection of law and politics, uh, which brings me to the title of her talk today, uh, Civil Juries and Democratic Republics. <laughs> Thank you so much for that lovely invitation, the lovely introduction, and the invitation. Uh, okay, so since antiquity, jury service has constituted a defining activity of democratic citizenship. Today, as the preeminent institution in which ordinary citizens render judgments, the jury plays a distinctive role in democracy. Whereas voting, the other core activity of citizens, seems to require merely the expression of interests or preferences, judgment on the jury seems to demand careful deliberation from an impartial standpoint. Despite the apparent disjunctures between jury service and voting, however, historically they've operated in tandem. In part because only those deemed competent to serve in these two domains have been accorded full and equal citizen rights in democracies. To be sure, the ostensible determination of competence has typically served exclusionary needs and provided a justification for limiting full citizenship to property holding, able-bodied, cognitively typical adult, adult white males. But from a different vantage point, efforts to assess the competence to vote and to serve on juries reflects the significant role that judgment plays in the exercise of citizen rights even if the metric of competence has historically been unjust and misguided and arbitrarily implemented. As Akhila Mar has argued, the only right secured in all state constitutions drafted between 1776 and 1787 was the right to a jury trial in criminal cases. And of course, three amendments to the Bill of Rights explicitly protect the jury. The Fifth Amendment, criminal grand juries, the Sixth, uh, criminal petty juries, and the Seventh, civil juries. Yet the right of ordinary citizens to serve on these juries has been hard fought. The colonies restricted jury duty to white male property holders. And though African Americans in the United States received the right to vote under the 15th Amendment, only in Strother versus West Virginia in 1880, and in companion cases, did the Supreme Court recognize the right to serve on juries. And though women received the right to vote under the 19th Amendment, only in Taylor versus Louisiana in 1975 did the Supreme Court deem unconstitutional the exclusion or automatic exemption of women from juries. Until 1960, federal courts used blue ribbon juries in which jury commissioners solicited names of men of recognized intelligence and probity from key men in the community. So at least in the United States, the equal right of citizens to serve as jurors is recently is relatively recent in origin, and it remains limited. Felons and those incapable of speaking or understanding English are among those who may be denied the right to serve. My claim today is the right, that the right to serve on a jury, like the right to vote, reflects a foundational commitment of democracy to equal respect for citizens' capacity for judgment. And that reflection upon this commitment 
reveals a distinctive theory of democratic legitimacy. I will argue that the legitimacy of democratic decisions, that the state is permitted to coercively enforce these decisions, derives from procedures that reflect this commitment. Perhaps surprisingly, today I will turn primarily not to the criminal, but to the much maligned civil jury. In turning to the civil jury's treatment of the tort of negligence, my argument is that a particular set of egalitarian procedures, notably the ongoing deliberative and defeasibly majoritarian activity of identifying anchoring community standards and evaluating proposed decisions against these standards, instantiates this principle of equal respect for judgment. My aim is not to defend the broader tort system or even civil juries more generally. Instead, it's to highlight the moral and epistemic value inherent in empowering ordinary citizens to serve in a fallible and iterated way as the arbiters of the norms of their own communities. Before I get into the weeds of the model of judgment on the civil jury, let me say at the outset that the jury has often served the purpose of illuminating theories of democratic legitimacy, notably epistemic theories. Consider, for instance, Rawls's account of imperfect procedural justice, which he illustrated by reference to a criminal trial. On this model, the desired outcome is that a defendant is convicted only if he is guilty. The trial procedure is a fallible means of achieving that outcome. In Rawls's words, while there is an independent criterion for the correct outcome, there is no feasible procedure which is sure to lead to it. Rawls suggested that this model could travel from the jury context to the just constitution. The just constitution would be more likely than any other to produce just and effective legislation. Similarly, David Estlin's model of epistemic proceduralism holds that both jury verdicts and democratic laws are legitimate and authoritative because they are produced by a procedure with a tendency to make correct decisions. My approach is different from the Rawls Estlin model. Their claim is that laws like verdicts derive their legitimacy from procedures with a tendency to produce correct decisions. One obvious challenge for an epistemic theory of democracy is to show that the scope of political questions for which there are right answers is not excessively narrow. Those critical of epistemic approaches often, and I think rightly, argue that the vast majority of democratic decisions are not true fact. So my focus is different. It's on the right to serve as a juror and the design of institutions to reflect equal respect for judgment. After all, again, the civil jury is much maligned. Many people have called for its abolition or its restrictive use in complex trials or those requiring technical knowledge. From the vantage point of just verdicts in a narrow truth-tracking sense, one could, in principle, make a compelling case that complex negligence trials ought to be situated with judges or some sort of mixed tribunal. So there might, in principle, be a trade-off between treating citizens with equal respect for their judgment and the defendants of the state interests in fair trials. But my basic claim is the following. Particularly in negligence trials, the jur civil jury is tasked with answering questions that we think ordinary citizens are best situated to judge. These questions address the identification of pre-existing community standards and the determination of whether a particular action conformed to that standard. In other words, we use civil juries in part because we believe that ordinary citizens are best situated to judge the existing standard in the community. The civil jury exemplifies what I will term epistemic egalitarianism. In principle, then, and in this restrictive context, there may be no trade-off between equal respect for judgment and just verdicts in the sense I suggested above. Again, I think that this commitment to treating citizens with equal respect for their capacity for judgment must lie at the heart of democracy, and that democratic procedure should be designed to reflect this respect. One final caveat before I get into the weeds. The justification for the civil jury, particularly at the time of the American founding, rested primarily on the jurors' tendencies to protect local debtors against more powerful private citizens and public officials. I don't deny that these justifications also matter, matter very greatly, and might constitute part of the content of citizens' judgments that give us a reason to situate final authority there. But today I'm interested more in the equal distribution of the right to judge and the mechanism shaping judgment formation rather than that particular sort of egalitarian feature. My claim is only that since the procedural logic of the civil trial reflects epistemic egalitarianism, 
better than most existing institutions, turning to it sheds light on how democratic procedures might be understood and reformed to produce justifiable outcomes. Okay, here we go. Although the judgment of ordinary citizens is crucial to the determination of negligence, it has remained largely unexamined by democratic theorists. Negligence is a tort, a civil wrong, consisting in injuring another person through conduct that is careless with respect to her. To prevail on an allegation of negligence, the plaintiff must establish that, one, she su suffered an injury, such as bodily harm or property damage. Two, the defendant owed the plaintiff a duty to conform her conduct to a standard necessary to avoid an unreasonable risk of harm to others. Three, the defendant's conduct fell below the applicable standard of care. And four, the defendant's carelessness was a proximate cause of the injury. When a negligence case is tried by a jury, the third of these issues, whether the conduct was careless, is left largely to the jury's judgment. And they are typically instructed by the judge to do so by reference to the care that would be taken by a reasonable person of ordinary prudence. That is the essential idea here. They do so, scholars from disparate perspectives overwhelmingly agree, in light of their understanding of prevailing community standards. Negligence thus constitutes a key context in which to examine the mechanism by which ordinary citizens identify and apply the norms of their community. From the perspective of lawyers, the negligence standard is a primary locus in which disputes uh, about the theory of tort law are fought. I want to entirely bracket these issues of the merits of law and economics approaches versus corrective justice or whatever. My interest is in the determination of the reasonable person standard. And virtually all scholars agree that jurors do look to community conventions in establishing the standard, even if they disagree about how jurors ought to conceptualize these norms. Moreover, there are fair critiques of the reasonable person standard. The biographical specificity of the model of the reasonable man highlights the obvious concern. Classic formulation, he, he mows the lawn in his shirt sleeves in the evening, takes the magazine at home, he rides the clock in the omnibus. The vision of the reasonable man is thus an adult, middle-class, heterosexual, able-bodied, cognitively typical white male. The reasonable man standard thus affirms the normalcy of this model and serves as a legal weapon against those who deviate from the standard. Once given flesh by a jury in the determination of negligence, reference to the reasonable man, even the reasonable person, can seem to reify a narrow conception of normal behavior or ordinary prudence. Attempts to embody the reasonable man differently, perhaps as a reasonable woman, risks essentializing attributes and affirming stereotypes. Yet these concerns, I think, are mitigated by the presence of a diverse jury. Indeed, one reason to affirm the use of a jury in the negligence context is that it jurors' individual notions of the ordinary person are likely to vary. And to the extent that they smuggle in biases, they are more likely to be challenged through the delivery of procedures. Okay, so bracketing those concerns, let me focus on how the jurors usually interpret the reasonable person standard. So before beginning deliberations, jurors receive instructions from judges, typically in the form of pattern instructions. In New York State, the instruction reads, negligence is lack of ordinary care. It is a failure to use that degree of care that a reasonably prudent person would have used under the same circumstances. By and large, pattern instructions point jurors to the pre-existing standards and expectations of safety, standards of safety in the community that the plaintiff could reasonably expect from the defendant. The civil jury's determination of the reasonable person standard depends crucially upon the no their knowledge of social norms. The jurors, the jurors constitute local experts as to the norms and expectations of their own community, hence the vicinage requirement. Jurors are thus well positioned to evaluate the litigants, the litigants' conduct against these standards. Unlike the judge, who might well be a member of a socioeconomic elite and an outlier in his perception of community standards. It is also the case that a juror in a civil trial is more likely to have personal experience with the circumstance of the case if the trial con concerns, for instance, an automobile accident. Most jurors would have had experience judging the prudent course of action, for instance, at a four-way stop sign or at a railroad crossing. And indeed, if they're members of the local community, they might actually know 
that, for instance, you know, 96th Street and Broadway is the most dangerous intersection in all the Upper West Side, and one would need to use special care there. Note that, in contrast, jurors on a criminal trial are substantially less likely to have had such experience with a particular criminal charge. Again, felons are excluded from jury service in 31 states and federal courts. And victims of similar crimes are likely to be excluded during war. Even Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was quite critical of giving the civil jury an ongoing role in setting the standard of care, recognized that the best case for it might be epistemic in this way. The court further feels that it is, it, it, it is not itself possessed of sufficient practical experience to lay down the rule intelligently. It conceives that 12 men taken from the practical part of the community can aid its judgment. Therefore, it aids its conscience by taking the opinion of the jury. In words of Harry Calvin, the jury, with its common sense and feel of the community, is the expert tribunal for the two great distinctive issues posed by the common law drawing the profile of negligence and handling the individual pricing of damages. So the jury's aim is to identify the standard of care required in a given community, that is, the prevailing norms in the community, and then evaluate a defendant's behavior with respect to that standard. Similarly, as we will see shortly, the claim to equal respect for judgment means that ordinary citizens and their elected representatives must be deemed competent to identify the constitutional or fundamental norms of their community, and tasked at least in the final instance with the responsibility for ensuring the congruence of particular policy decisions with those norms. Let me turn now to the procedures of the civil jury. So my claim here is that this epistemic egalitarian principle underlying the civil jury helps us to under understand and identify what would be justifiable democratic procedures. One feature of this procedure, it might be random selection, which while essential on the jury model, might not be a procedural requirement of democratic decision making more generally. I'm going to bracket that. We can talk about it in the discussion if you like, but for now I'm not going to give myself to that. But the civil jury is procedurally relatively egalitarian in two additional respects. First, the standard of proof, and secondly, the vote threshold. Taken together, these features reflect the procedural accommodation of the risk of error, which is distributed far more equitably than on, under a criminal model. I believe these features, highlighting the provisional, and later I'll emphasize the iterated feature of decision making, are essential for the justifiability of democratic decision making. Our procedures must reflect fallibility and allocate the risk of decision making such that the status quo is not excessively privileged. But to explain how the, this principle helps to justify a particular set of procedures, I think it's first helpful to look closely at the way in which judgments of civil negligence are rendered. The standard of proof for virtually all trials of civil negligence is preponderance of evidence. Preponderance is the lowest standard of proof. The next most stringent, used for civil suits initiated by the government, which affected defendant's liberty, is the clear and convincing evidence standard or the clear, unequivocal and convincing evidence standard. The most stringent required for criminal trials is beyond reasonable doubt. The Supreme Court has held that in a civil dispute over damages, application of a fair preponderance of evidence standard indicates both society's minimal concern with the outcome and a conclusion that the litigant should share the risk of error in roughly equal fashion, whereas in a criminal trial, the aim should be to exclude, as nearly as possible, the likelihood of an erroneous judgment. The lower the standard of proof, the more equitable the assignment of risk, and the bias in favor of the defendant diminishes to near, to near equity in the case of the civil trial. A second significant distinction among these standards concerns the extent to which the outcome ought to command our confidence in its justice. That is, it constitutes a signal to the wider community <coughs> that the verdict is correct. For criminal trials, the beyond a reasonable doubt verdict standard is supposed to is intended to constitute the strongest possible signal that the accused was rightly convicted. When the standard falls, the juror's confidence in its determination of liability may also fall. Of course, it need not. A civil jury could, in principle, have confidence in the liability of a defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. 
But because the jury does not have an opportunity to convey this information, the signal it sends to the community as a whole via the preponderance standard is necessarily less robust than under reasonable doubt. That the signal is apparently weaker, as we will see, should not concern us. In fact, it's important for the justifiability of democratic decision making more generally, as we'll see. Note also the difference between the vote threshold on um, criminal versus civil trials. Although the unanimity rule is nearly ubiquitous for criminal trials in the United States, it's required for federal trials, and I believe in all states except for Louisiana and Oregon. The Supreme Court has deemed it unnecessary for non-capital trials, assuming the size of the jury is not as small as six. In civil trials, however, the matter is different. Federal juries must still be unanimous, but only 18 states require unanimity. 29 states permit supermajorities of two-thirds and five-sixths in civil cases. The threshold drops from unanimity to supermajority after six hours of deliberation in three states. The general claim is that the civil trial structure accommodates a degree of fallibility and of dissent that the criminal trial model does not. This might be for good reason. The reasonable doubt standard and perhaps the unanimity rule might be essential to protect the defendant's right to a fair trial. And especially if the unanimity rule is asymmetrical to preserve the presumption of innocence. But there's a real cost to unanimity. There's substantial evidence from social psychology that a lone holdout, uh, famous from 12 Angry Men, is to say mythological is perhaps too strong, but it is, uh, you know, is not common. Unanimity courts coercion, as deliberation aims at persuading these lone dissenters to alter their view, which they typically do. So the preponderance of evidence standard, combined with a lower vote threshold, reflects both the acceptance of a greater degree of fallibility and enables dissenters to signal that, that in fact, they disagree with the verdict. My basic claim is that these mechanisms, once combined with deliberation, reflect not just merely the aim of just verdicts, but actually convey equal respect for the judgment of jurors as well. The scope of these, this judgment in the domain of negligence trials, again, is the community's norms, expectations governing the standard of care, and the determination of liability with respect to that standard. What does an emphasis on equal respect for judgment, as against through civil jury, mean for the justification of democratic decision-making more generally? This is where things start getting even more complicated. The move is as follows. Ordinary citizens identify the community norm, and they evaluate a particular act with respect to that norm. And my claim is that this particular activity of judgment, formed by a deliberation and through an iterated set of procedures that reflect fallibility and the possibility of dissent, <coughs> point us again towards this broader account of democratic legitimacy, which I'm uh, terming judgment democracy or judgment theory of democracy. Let me identify the core features of this theory and then give you a sense of how it travels from beyond the jury domain. It entails, first, the view that citizens ought to be treated with equal respect for their capacity for judgment, which supports the equal distribution of voting rights and the opportunity to serve on juries. Second, a cognitive account of voting, in which votes constitute expressions of judgments. And in this particular domain, as we've seen, the community standards themselves and the compatibility of a proposed policy, in this case, or the, the liability of a defendant under this under the standard. Third, a deliberative mechanism of judgment formation. And fourth, defeasible and majoritarian procedures with only weak systematic biases in favor of one typically status quo outcome. Okay, so the first point is, what does it mean to treat citizens with equal respect for their capacity for judgment? Does it entail the view that they are presumptively equal in that capacity? It might, it probably doesn't, but it does certainly entail the view that we ought to treat citizens as judgmental equals. Putative claims of inferiority of judgment, manifested perhaps most viciously in literacy tests, serve to justify the exclusion of African Americans from the polls. Elizabeth Anderson, in responding to the lucky egalitarian claim that the state should compensate the disabled, the un unintelligent, the untalented, and the ugly, for their misfortune, argues similarly. Having sketched a hypothetical letter from the State Equality Board outlining to recipients the justification for sending them a check, 
She says, could a self-respecting citizen fail to be insulted by such messages? How dare the state pass judgments on its citizens' worth as workers and lovers, and I would say also as judges. Put in institutional form, then, it's going to preclude million accounts for plural voting, and it's going to incline us, as we shall see in a moment, towards, again, defeasible majoritarian mechanisms which weigh votes. Second, this account of democracy rests broadly on a cognitive model of voting, sort of akin to the account offered by Joshua Cohen, but with a different balance. For Cohen, a cognitive account of voting constitutes the view that voting expresses beliefs about what the correct policies are according to the independent standard, not personal preferences for policies. Here, the independent standard is radically deflated from the epistemic conception of democracy. We can think of that as a general will, we think of that as truth, um, to the commitments of a given community. As the civil jury illustrates, Jurors render judgments both about what the requisite standard of care is, so there's an independent standard of care that they're rendering judgments about what the proper interpretation is, and about whether the litigants have satisfied it. One important question raised by the cognitive model of voting is whether individual preferences are impermissible guides to the compatibility of a particular outcome with the long-term commitments of the community, as Cohen suggests they might be. One possible response is to suggest this is taken from a, a slight modification of Thomas Christiano's view, is to, deter, is to suggest that the determination of individuals' preferences or interests itself entails a cognitive process, Christiano's language. Citizens do not advance their interests directly, they advance what they believe to be their interests. So where, where there are conflicts of interest, there are conflicts between what citizens judge to be their interests. So there's this cognitive process by which people identify what their interests and preferences are. In other domains, a second response uh, derives from Dewey, who of course defended the capacity of ordinary citizens to judge best where the shoe pinches. Drawing on these responses in a very wide literature about the value of situated judgment, one might think that the way in which individuals judge communal matters necessarily derives from their particular experiences within a community, which will entail partiality and particular preferences at that initial stage. Yet few would defend, I don't intend to defend, the view that these immediate individual level judgments suffice to render outcomes legitimate. So third, the formation of these judgments must derive from deliberation. This is for two reasons. Uh, deliberation improves the quality of these judgments, and perhaps even more importantly, it helps to reduce the propensity to identify either narrow or dominant group conceptions of community standards. Both functions are essential to the epistemic egalitarian commitments undergirding this account of democracy. Again, the special importance of deliberation in negligence trials derives from the necessity to specify the reasonable person standard. Because this standard is grounded on community sentiment, a diverse ju jury is likely to outperform a judge or a small one. Fourth and finally, Judgment democracy requires majoritarian procedures with only weak systematic biases in favor of one typical status quo outcome. <coughs> Even though the model of judgment democracy should be egalitarian, majoritarian procedures should be preferred on the grounds that they treat these judgments equally, they may be defeasible, as in cases in which the community prefers to bias in favor of one set of judgments. As in the case of the jury, either a strong bias for the criminal in favor of acquittal, or the civil jury perhaps a, a slight bias. A high supermajoritarian <coughs> amendment procedure reflects the view that constitutional norms need to have a very strong bias in their favor because amendment courts greater risk of error than entrenchment does. This I've argued elsewhere in general is a mistaken approach. To be sure, there are some norms that express fundamental commitments of the community, in this case civil and political rights, such as the right to vote, the right to serve on a jury. And indeed, they merit such a bias. However, given the possible, in most other cases, norms don't merit such a bias in their favor. Given the possibility of utility drift, the failure to amend may actually create a greater risk of instability and worse outcomes than amendment. The reason to emphasize the equitable allocation of risk is that it reaffirms the, the importance of the capacity to revise both particular policy decisions 
and more importantly, to ensure that the presence of a local independent standard does not lead to domination. So the central claim is that democratic decisions receive their legitimacy from having been produced by a procedure that treats citizens with equal respect for their judgment. Let me say that not every decision within a democracy needs to follow this decisional structure, and particularly not this structure contained within the civil jury of discerning, anchoring community standards, and evaluating proposals against that. There might be many circumstances in which this particular structure is enact, including elections for representatives. And again, the account I've offered here does not, does not preclude that. But I do think that the core principle of equal respect for judgment ought to anchor institutional choices um, along the lines that I suggested more generally. The institutional locus in which I think this model of democracy, this judgment democracy, has its sharpest bite is for constitutionalism, in which it broadly vindicates the ambition of popular constitutionalists, such as Akhil Amar, Larry Kramer, Sandy Levinson, Rita Siegel, Mark Tushnet, Jeremy Waldron, and especially Elizabeth Beaumont. Uh, in her wonderful recent book, The Civil Constitution, Liz Beaumont, in particular, demonstrates the historically significant and ongoing role that ordinary citizens have played in both producing and giving interpretive force to constitutional norms. She describes how formal textual provisions are the visible outgrowth of groups' work to plant new governing ideals or transform older ideas, and that civic groups of ordinary citizens played a crucial role in shaping and reshaping the boundaries lived meanings of constitutional provisions. The work of others, especially Kramer and Waldron, argues specifically for the capacity of ordinary citizens to render judgments about the sorts of questions situated, at least in this country, often with the judiciary. In their view, the turn to judges relies on ref and reflects a profound skepticism about the ability of politicians and ordinary citizens to handle constitutional questions. Indeed, in Kramer's words, Supporters of judicial supremacy are today's aristocrats. The claim of judgment democracy is not that all decisions, constitutional and otherwise, must be made by recourse to immediate referendum of the citizenry. In my book, Counting the Many, for instance, I sketch a set of complex majoritarian institutions, including a set of mechanisms for constitutional amendment that I think better instantiate the aim of equal respect for judgment than do equal existing procedures. The central point, though, is that the ultimate decision as to the scope and nature of a community's commitments and the compatibility of proposed legislation with those commitments must lie with the citizens and the legislators. It is not sufficient to treat citizens with equal concern, as in Ronald Dworkin's view, which might be compatible with their utter passivity and which fails to respect them as bearers of judgment. Moreover, identifying the equal judgment basis of democratic procedures also helps to evade some challenges facing those defending proceduralist models. It shows, for instance, why a coin flip does not constitute a fair procedure. It's not responsive to the judgment of the citizens. In a more complicated fashion, the equal judgment presumption also provides a response to an important objection to those uh, defending majoritarian procedures. What if majority rule is used to disenfranchise minority voters or to enact unjust laws? To ask this requires several steps. First, one has to admit at the outset that, that uh, democratic decisions, justifiable democratic decisions on this account, may end up being substantively unjust. Legitimacy and justice can actually come apart on this model. This is one reason, perhaps, to separate the question of political obligation from the broader question of political justification. Yet second, it's important to bear in mind that any procedure may yield unjust outcomes. There are no philosopher kings dwelling in our midst. And the value of a democratic procedure on this model is that these procedures accord the judgmental capacity for citi of citizens the respect one would hope citizens extend to each other. In defending the ability of ordinary citizens and their representatives, to render judgment about the scope and nature of constitutional rights, the, you know, the epitome of constitutional of community norms. Jeremy Waldron's signature insight holds. Citizen participation in this domain calls upon the very capacities that rights as such connote and evinces a form of respect 
in the resolution of political disagreement, which is continuous with respect that rights is such a thing. Is there an impermissibly high risk of error of failure to recognize the equal status of citizens qua judges in substantive legislation on this theory? Here's where the distribution of biases becomes important. Like the bias against the risk of erroneous conviction, constitutional norms in principle merit a bias in favor of their protection against the risk of erroneous appeal, repeal. I'm sorry. Because no norm is guaranteed to yield just outcomes, especially once interpreted, though, no norm merits permanent entrenchment, nor a status quo bias via a supermajority threshold that is de facto unattainable or sufficiently high to preclude meaningful efforts at revision. Justification derives from citizen and or legislative participation in the activity of identifying and recreating standards. When these standards may no longer remain subject to meaningful citizen judgment and revision, they do become unjustifiable on democratic grounds. The epistemic egalitarianism, I've hoped to show that dem uh, in judgment democracy, helps to provide a principled foundation for the important historical and institutional insights of popular constitutionalists. Okay, so I'll conclude here. I've argued that reflection upon the civil jury sheds light on a distinctive theory of democratic legitimacy. The core of this theory is the equal respect for citizens with respect to their capacity for judgment. And my argument is that a particular set of egalitarian procedures, notably the ongoing deliberative and defeasibly majoritarian activity of identifying anchoring community standards and of evaluating proposed decisions against these standards, best instantiate this principle. The civil jury, in decline globally and at home, remains an unlikely source for democratic Yet its ostensible faults in expert rulings, ongoing and flexible determination of community standards, non-unanimous thresholds, turn out to be distinctive benefits for democracy more generally. Thanks, I look forward to your comments. We may be in the center. Yeah, in the center. Um, thanks for the talk. It was, uh, it was great. I'm broadly sympathetic with a lot of the things that you've said, but I'm wondering how your argument works when we move from civil juries to democracy. I mean, one thing that strikes me is that if we buy your argument about civil juries, part of the argument is that they're epistemically well suited to the task of figuring out these community standards. I mean, they are, in a sense, experts at this one thing. Like, if we grant you that, What's the case for them having the same level of expertise with respect to complicated questions in constitutional law, all of the other complicated sort of considerations that democracies have to face, um, and stuff like that? And, and, and then there's another concern that I have, which is specifically their vulnerability, or at least what your answer would be to the sort of Dworkin forums of principle sort of argument. I mean, like, at least one argument that he levels against the idea of popular constitutionalism is that the populace is sort of prone to being pushed around by sort of narrow self-interest in a way that presumably this court that's full of elites who are immune from electoral pressure or whatever are aren't. I mean, I, I don't know whether I buy any of that, but I just wondered what you yeah. thought about. Thanks. Um, okay, so that is part of why I don't want to go fully down the random selection path. I, it's not... I, I am eager to resist the fact that that means that representation is impermissible, for instance, that this account entails purely, um, purely lottery-based selection, people because any person is, is equally capable to assess what these numbers are. I think that is an implausible claim. However, that citizens themselves are well positioned to figure out who serves as an expert for these purposes, I think is a reasonable and so situating the role of determining these standards, the compatibility of legislation with constitutionalism, with legislators rather than, in the final instance at least, with justices, I think is where I want to be in the story. Now, is it the case that the people are pushed around by now self-interest in a way that courts are, uh, are immune from? I think it's very hard to come to realism and sustain that. I, I myself would be suspicious of that. I'm suspicious of a claim like that. 
That said, I am not arguing that there could not be advisory capacity performed by courts. It's simply who ought to have final say about what these standards are and compatibility. And that I want to situate with legislatures rather than with the judiciary. Um, so, I was, on the train, I was reading Epistemic Democracy and Its Challenges, and I, thought, <laughs> I had to read something. Um, so, you know, I want to I ask about the judgment democracy, because it seems interesting, but I, I don't I'm understanding something about the ground. So the first point you were saying about judgment democracy requires that citizens ought to be treated with equal respect for capacity for judgment. So I can see the argument that juries, because they come up with the correct answer, and I can see the argument that juries because of democratic autonomy, it doesn't matter if they come up with the right answer. Because we're deciding it. Yeah. I don't understand where yours fits in with that. Yes. Um, the reason... <coughs> so, this is, so you're, of course, pushing me on the exact point that I'm feeling um, that is the most challenging for me. I think the argument that I want to make is that there are points at which we're going to think that there's a real trade-off between um, getting the answer right and equal respect. I think that there are many cases in which the jury might actually be that case. And so again, the reason why I'm turning to the civil jury is that it seems like a hard case. There are really good reasons to suspect that the civil jury might not be well suited to performing a whole set of tasks. In this particular restrictive area, what it means for them to get the right answer is really coterminous, coterminous with their um, with their particular capacities, or what what we expect them to be local experts in. Like this. Let me approach this from a different standpoint. So, if you imagine a criminal jury, what a so a somewhat stylized model of a criminal jury entails jurors trying to figure out whether or not a person is guilty or innocent, and that determination is supposed to track the truth. So we know that we've reached a just verdict, and I think in the stylized models that are offered by in the Rawls estimate approach, I think it's whether or not we've reached the right answer. That's and the probability of reaching the right answer there that's supposed to justify the procedure here. What I want to say is that in the civil jury context, it's the, there's a distinction. It's not strictly it's somewhat truth tracking, but it's a but it's actually a much lower standard. It's not supposed to be. I think this the criminal model pushes us towards a very strong form of truth, and this is supposed to bring the independent standard down. So the determination is really about community standards, what that is, as opposed to the truth of liability out there. Mm -hmm. There might be some truth as to whether or not somebody is is. Uh, you know, morally responsible for this action. But I'm not claiming that the civil jury is getting into that. I'm saying that the civil jury is mostly good at identifying this particular feature and, avail and evaluating the defendant's behavior with respect to that. So it's a deflated standard, I think, from epistemic democracy. And it also derives from, again, this is why it's a proceduralist model. And Eslam's is a proceduralist model, too, but this is intended to be a different, it's, intended to be primarily an egalitarian proceduralist model because it focuses primarily on the judgmental capacity of citizens, even in domains that we think are completely non-truth act. So once you move away from the jury, the jury context, we move to the constitutional context, for instance, or other sort of legislative contexts, we might think that there is no truth to the matter about what the First Amendment really means. But we think that the way in which we figure that out is by reference to the citizens or the representatives, is that they're the bearers of that judgment. And failing to treat them as the bearers of the judgment about that is to treat them with disrespect. That's the story. That's a quick follow-up. Yep. So um, Arendt, in her lectures on Kant, she, just, she says Kant's great distinction is of the difference between Verstand and Vernunft. And Verstand is understanding, which is like engineering knowledge or specialist technical knowledge. And fair enough, she translates as thoughtfulness. And, um, and and sort of Kant's great discovery was that you don't have to be wise to be good. You don't have to be an engineer to have like a good moral capacity. 
So I, when I'm hearing your talk, I'm trying to translate this this res equal respect for capacity for judgment. Is it is it for Verstand? Or is it Vernunft? Or, or how would you try to work within that? So you, you don't have to answer now. Just that, that's what I'm thinking about when, when I'm hearing you talk. Like how, how do you match up with Kantian distinctions about smarts versus goodness? Um, one point that I want to make, and this is not going to be particularly responsive, particularly responsive to the event of Kantian story, is that I want to bring the epistemic and the moral point. I want to tie them very closely together so that um, we respect people's judgment as in their capable, their you know capacity to make informed decisions in that sense, to make technically adequate decisions so as to the content of community standards, but also that treating them that this action is both motivated and imposed, but when we treat them with equal respect for judgment, that is that is itself treating them as moral agents. So it's not sufficient to say, for instance, that we're gonna, again, part of this is the equal concern story, or other sorts of models that treat people with equal respect. It's not simply that we want to treat people as equal with equal respect qua their status as human beings. We want to treat them with respect for this judgmental capacity. And this way, in this way, we do that's the story, at least. How it maps onto the distinction we're offering, we should just talk more. Okay. Um, so, uh, so there are a couple of, uh, basically, I, I want to follow up on, on, on this question. I think is maybe a, a different uh, terminology of the question will we'll, we'll maybe um, uh, illustrate this. Perhaps what, what is, in a, in a sense, very confusing about it? epistemic egalitarianism, right? So um, in, in trying to combine these, these two ideas, it seems like on the one hand, you're trying to preserve the instrumentalism of epistemic democracy. Right? But of course, the objection to epistemic democracy is among other things that, you know, what if judges do a better job? What if a philosopher king comes along, right? Um, there seems to be a, a, a surrendering or a, a give sort of human dignity um, as hostage to the facts, something like that. Um, and egalitarianism is not is not about that. Like right? egalitarianism is precisely about affirming respect for persons as such. Yeah. Um, and it seems like I, I I don't have it quite clear where you're coming down with those. It sounds a lot like you want to emphasize equal respect for for judgmental judgmental capacity. That sounds like egalitarianism to me. Yes. Um, it doesn't sound very epistemic. Um, so I'm I'm a little confused on where where the epistemic uh, legitimacy story is is, is coming in uh, on this account. Yeah. Um, and the other thing uh, I suppose actually maybe ties in with this a little bit. I, I think uh, that I don't know your name, but the first question. <laughs> um, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard in that question a concern about why we should see sort of ordinary political questions as relatively similar to the kinds of questions that civil juries uh, are, are recognized as being apt uh, to decide. Why should we um, see, or why should we export, be, feel like we can export that model to lots of other decisions which aren't like that, or maybe aren't obviously like that? Yeah. Um, so one point that I, I'm trying to make is that it's not that this particular model of judgment goes toward, goes to every domain. Um, I think that the parallel is sharpest in the constitutional con context because there we have a set of prevailing standards that we need to interpret. We need to interpret them uh, anew and we have to evaluate policies with respect to that standard. That sort of, that structure of judgment I think parallels neatly with the civil jury, uh, with the, the civil jury decision. More tendentious is a claim that I've made in earlier versions of this paper that I'm backing away from here, which is that this could segue neatly into a model of legislative decision making, which what a legislature is tasked with doing is identifying a set of prevailing norms and evaluating the policies with respect to that. It's not clear to me that that's what I want as an optimal model of legislative decision making. What I would care about is that however a legislature is composed is that it reflects this uh, 
equal judgment in other respects. Um, so that's the second point. The first point remains the harder one, which is what remains in the epistemic model, for instance, once we move to the constitutional domain. Is there anything epistemic? The epistemic stuff, I think, is really about the idea, is somewhat contained in the cognitive account. That is, we really think that what's entailed is not the expression of group preferences as such. It is this process of identifying something out there. And it's not, I don't want to tie myself to a conception again of the general will, nor do I want to say that there is one proper interpretation of the Constitution which our citizens or legislators are tasked with identifying. Nonetheless, the idea that what we're doing as members of a community is trying to work out what these norms entail, and that, that that part of the process is something that all citizens can participate in, even if they don't have final final say. Although in the, in the final instance, I do think that there should be a real role, important role for citizens in a constitutional amendment process, which would have feature these defeasible majoritarian procedures that I've talked about. So ultimately, citizens would have that role. But the idea is that when we think about citizens' agency, we think about it in this sort of epistemic way while backing off radically on what the content of the independent standard is. It's primarily intended to be an egalitarian proceduralist model while retaining some of the epistemic features. Did you want to follow up? Sorry, I wonder how you would respond to um, someone interpreting your, your model in, in the sense of like, you know, the, uh, the kind of interpretation of community standards that might be going on at, on, the, on these constitutional questions is basically like, you know, what does you know, equal respect of the laws mean here? So there's, in a sense, like the, the sort of, I write this up on the board for my students, right, between the general and the particular, yeah. right? And to, to, to get from the general to the particular, that's an epistemic task. You can yeah. describe it as a task of judgment, fine. Yes. But you can also just say that we actually don't know what the truth of the matter is. We actually have to figure it out. Yes. And that's an epistemic task. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's an iterated one, is the point that I want to make. You know, one way to go about this, I think that you know, was Martha Minow's work on the interpretive theory of law that I thought was, uh, was insightful on this point. That what we do is we, law community, and lots of different loci of communities, are trying to work out are, are advocating different conceptions of what these norms are going to be. We're trying to identify what these standards are, make meaning of them anew, and contest them. That's what I'm hoping to do, but I do want to hang on to that for the reasons that you've suggested as an epistemic sort of activity, even if I think ultimately the procedures that we're thinking about are egalitarian and that the, the legitimacy of these procedures comes from their from the equal distribution rather than tracking the truth or identifying an independent standard as such. Can I take my frog in to jump in with that question? Um, since uh, you uh, referenced popular constitutionalism, it makes me, um, in my, uh, my mind turns to the more unruly activities of juries, in particular jury nullification. Yes. And I'm wondering where, if there's a place where that fits into your story. Yeah. Um, if you could say yeah, about yeah. That. I mean, I think that's going to be that's an interesting question, and um, in particular on the obligation side of the story, which I'm not quite, which I think I'm not quite ready to talk about. What I do think is important from to hang on to for the jury notification story as such is that it's identified a set of norms that that are either wrongly applied in a particular case or just are entirely unjust. It's that identification again of a standard norm that they think to be completely incongruent with their conception of justice. And especially if they think that their conception of justice is not their own conception of justice, it's the, their, what they think is rightly the community account of justice. It's entirely compatible with that. Now, does it mean that I think that, that during nullification? I mean, it is because, by virtue of the, of the commitment to fallibility and dissent, it does seem to support a you know the principle of jury nullification. I would want to think about some of the implications of it, the particular particular the general and other source perspectives what it means to have a particular local jury engaging in this activity of disobedience. But um, but because I do want to save 
a role for civil disobedience throughout this story, it has to be compatible with the accounting journal tradition that I think you want to come into. Just, yeah, well, in, in, that, that community standards have a codified place yes. in this area, and it, it almost sounds like that comes into jury nullification in the criminal side, yeah. but it comes in by the jurors themselves yes. almost, not as a as an explicit task set by the judge. Yes, so yeah, and, and, and you probably know there's a way of controversy about what people should be informed about. Yeah. And so on this account, it might be that, yes, people have to be informed about their... Um, that part of judgmental capacity extends potentially to nullification, but I have not really. But I'm just thinking on the yeah. fly. Um, I have no argument with your argument, uh, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, the three points that occurred to me yes. that might enlarge on what you're saying in the history of Western law, I would usually point to the Magna Carta. Mm -hmm. as the origin of judgment by one's peers. Yeah. And actually those words are in the Magna Carta. And that was done not as some kind of egalitarian sense, but as a fear of the, or the authorities that would actually rob property from, primarily from estates upon the death of the noble, the, the, the noble person who owned those estates. Yeah. And that was a rampant activity by King John, and that was to protect themselves against that taking. So it's not that that was supposed to be so good that it was equal and by one peers, it was a protection against authority that had no limit. Yeah. So we shouldn't forget that that was done out of fear, not as a sense of good. We're, we're heading yeah. towards goodness, but we're afraid mostly of authority, the Hobbesian right. authority, right. right? The second thing is that you rely on uh, or suggest that community feedback is an important process in that these deliberations are private but the verdicts are public and the contentions are public because they're in a court yes and uh, we don't really have to seek the justification of the jury's reasoning yes. or, or conclude that it was valid yeah. we just need them to do it yeah. but I also think that I question how much feedback that those cases actually provide to any prospective juror yeah. who I doubt would read the results of a lot of civil yeah. trials. Yeah. And that now perhaps only 5% of civil trials actually go to court. Right. <laughs> so most of those deliberations and things are buried. Yes, okay. right. Third point is that let's not forget that the, especially in civil, if we stick to civil, the only time the jury is using their collective judgment is when you're trying to decide what the valid, date, the, the valid definition is in a particular case of the word reasonable. Is that reasonable behavior under the circumstances? Yeah. That word reasonable is written into most civil contracts or places where that will happen, where that deliberation is required. Yeah. It's an invitation by the parties to defer an interpretation of reasonableness to such a time when there is a dispute. Uh -huh. they, they cannot define it at the time that they're making their agreement. Uh -huh. And so that deliberation by that jury is done by invitation <coughs> between the parties in advance, saying this is where we're going to bring the citizens in to decide whether what we did was reasonable or not. And that I think that's an important uh, element that they're, these parties are not having that, you know, voice it on them. They're holding that door open to allow for a public interpretation of reasonable behavior. Okay, that's interesting, and I take that to be just you know a friendly suggestion yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, what that first point? Yeah, absolutely. Look, there is a, a part of this this extremely um, expansive project is the history of these twinned capacities, which is to suggest that they do not have one source. Do not have faith. And qualifications for one sometimes not strict the other. I am interested in early English inquest juries where the reason why there is this massive expansion is not because there's a reflection in the equal, there's a belief in the equal capacity of you know, peasants to serve. It's because there's actual a body of, of knowledge, there's a body of information about property holdings that the king made. So they're bringing information there. So there are all different sorts of stories that are going to be at play once we look at the long history. Totally. 
The second point on the um, absence of justification for reasoning, so that you don't need to promulgate that. One point that I wanted to make, one reason why I think that, why I'm concerned about the, the use of unanimity rules, and this is something that I bring with that in other contexts, uh, in favor of supermajority decision making, is that the capacity to signal disagreement, even if you're not providing reasons, I think is might be really critical on appeal. I think that there is some sort of societal benefit being able to see that there is act that there is actually a disagreement, enabling jurors to own their judgments in that respect. Often the source of future legislation. Right. <laughs> that too. That too. So oh um I'm not arguing that all jury deliberation needs to be public or that reasons need to be given. I mean there might be there might be reasons to think about that. But again, my story is not about the legitimacy of the civil jury and how we might reform the civil jury. It's about what we can learn from looking about the reason at the reasons why the civil jury um, is uh, to the extent that it's defended or exists, continues to exist, and what that what that shed what light that might shed on democracy. But that's a, you know, so it's a slightly different enterprise. Well, my questions are a little bit um, outside of the boundary of the specific paper, I guess. And I'm always worried about justifications of democracy and make it seem like a philosophy colloquium or a deliberation among philosophy professors. So um, along those lines, um, two things. I mean, what kinds of claims did you want to make about the extrapolation from juries or the connection between juries and voting? I know this a little outside of the specific, yeah. but there seem to be real crucial differences, not just with legislation, but even the general project of uh, political democracy as being about what we should do or what we and our representatives should do rather than about a judgment about an individual case and what they did do and responsibility and so forth. So that's one question is sort of you know, is this supposed to map onto that or strengthen an account of uh, a kind of something in place I have to say, judgmental democracy more generally and whether it would do so. So that's kind of yeah. an ex. And, but the other one is if you could say a little bit more about what you take judgment to be. What is judgment? And it worries me. In certain readings of judgment, it has been exclusionary so that there are plenty of people who may. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, we also want more about a person. We want more about people to be considered yeah. than their judgment. Yes. Uh, their needs, their uh, interests, their agency yes. are all very crucial in a richer conception of democracy in yeah. some way. So if, I realize it's kind of big questions. Yeah. And also specifically, what is a capacity for judgment rather than just judgment? Yeah. yeah. So the reason for the capacity for judgment is that um, to make it what I want is the most inclusionary model possible. And part of the reason why I didn't want to just respect judgment, I wanted to respect capacity for judgment, is that I think that what that this is that that is possessed even more broadly than broadly enough. I don't know. I mean, so yes, there's we ways in which we impute to people, and I think that the imputation of that is actually a really is actually really fundamental. Um, so in prior versions of this paper, I had accounts of presuming the equal capacity, uh, presuming an equal capacity for judgment. That I think is a little bit stronger than it needs to be to make the argument run in. So I backed off on that, but I'm, I've been going back and forth on it. In part because what I want to say is that the reason why we want democracy, my story is the reason why we want democracy in the first place, is because we think that this that collective decision making um, ought to be made by basically everyone, that everyone should play a role in making decisions. Um, that's part of the why there's this long history of going to Athens and whatever. Now, of course, as you're immediately going to say, well, Athens is not Athens, is an example of a place which concerned who was actually capable of making a judgment rather narrowly. And yes, that's true. It is more expansive. I mean, we. It's more expensive than, than other regimes at the time, but it is still relatively narrow. Um, and so does this account presuppose that I'm picking out something that's going to, for instance, uh, preclude the cognitively disabled? 
from being able to participate in. This is something that I thought a little bit about, not as much as I want. I would be very concerned about an account that meant that by virtue of the fact that people were in some, had some sort of, um, were somehow neurologically atypical or cognitively atypical, it meant that they were not capable of, of serving, of performing these things. I think what we need as a society, what I would hope the direction of this project is going to go is to say, well, look, this is so fundamental that what we need is to make as wide a citizen possible, population as possible able to participate, which means all different sorts of assistance in these different types of domains. Right? Yeah. It, it generates other problems. It generates other problems about who's, how do you actually identify what people's, what people want, or is that, or where you? Well, I just think a judgment sounds pretty unrestricted compared to other options. I'm not sure because and how do you know what, whether somebody? I mean, how do we identify? Or on what basis do we impute some, uh, to someone that they have a capacity or an equal capacity or some kind of? Capacity? What does it mean more than reason? Does it mean reason? Does it mean uh, no, it, may, it means that it, it's essentially at its. This is part of this is part of a more complicated story. It's partially going to to have um, to be able to serve at, as a member of a collective body that is generated that is producing. That is producing collective judgments, but that has a whole host of other sorts of problems associated with it. It ends up being circular. So, how do we know what it means for on the individual level for somebody to possess judgment? This is why I have been wanting to say that it's imputed to citizens by virtue essentially of their of their status. Their status, you know, as as agents. Yeah, which is I'm happy with that. Yeah, that's essentially it's essentially. Um, yeah. Okay. But did you have any comment on the first? Oh, the first one. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So I so part of the reason this may actually be speaking to the second point um, as well is to say is to break down the preference judgment model. So. One of the concerns that I had about the, the way in which epistemic democracy developed was that I thought it presupposed it or it advocated a strong disjuncture between uh, voters as bearers of group preferences on the one hand and other sorts of elites as the bearers of judgment. That so my main aim here is to try to say, well, no. We don't advocate purely our preferences or our interests. We we advocate what we consider what we consider to be as that's a cognitive activity. It's not purely cognitive. It's also emotional. It has all different sorts of components to it. I don't want to you know I'm not intending to be you know to be really narrow, but that there's a way in which I thought that was that was respectful of the way that these preferences is not. Um, so. What happens for juries voting? Is it the same sort of judgment that would be rendered in these different domains? No, which is part of why I've been backing off on the idea that we have one model that travels across all different sorts of institutions. However, what I'm suggesting is that the model of the model um, that I was sketching in the civil jury might travel nicely to the constitutional sort of domain. Does it travel into that that legislative issue where we might think that? Uh, this was the, the, perhaps part of the Dworkinian story of how the versus the principal thing. I also think that I think it's difficult to draw those lines as well. What is a matter of policy versus what is a matter of principle? The classic example of where it built a ballpark. Well, once you start building a ballpark, you know, over in a low income community, it turns into a matter of justice as well. So I don't want to, so I'm saying that all of these things um, are going to involve. Types of uh, types of of, of judgments, um, even if the way in which we want these judgments to be formed just going to differ across domains. Um, so, so you called this uh, judgment theory of democracy, and it seems like it also is lower case D democratizing the process or access to judgment, um, or you know, ma making judgments that affect the community. And the epistemic value of that is that lots of 
people with different experiences but some kind of overlapping commitment to something that's common bring different things to the table might be like one way of thinking about this and value of that. Um, right, you say that people have experiences with the kinds of things they're making judgments on in civil cases as opposed to criminal cases. But it seems to me like the epistemic value of that could also be, it could also offer um, a critique of a kind of truth-seeking of epistemic judgment making, right? Because you can, I think you can imagine a case where, um, you know, like a murder case where somebody's being like violently abused for years and then commits murder. You can imagine a situation where a community of people who had those experiences would come to make a judgment on that based on a kind of reflection on community morals that isn't about like seeking the truth of like guilty or, or innocent and that maybe a kind of maybe this model of sort of of this epistemic value is a like an a critique of kind of truth seeking. Let me make sure I'm right. So it's the case that there are going to be lots of determinations also in the criminal context that might take us up whether or not something mm -hmm. would be like a court action or a defense or the scope of defense. You know, there are particular issues that are in the criminal law that might be resolved by reference to a similar sort of model. So if, so that's one possibility. So that might be, that's surely the case. Is it the case that I, but I took you to be making a different point about the status of whether or not any of this is truth tracking, or mm -hmm. it's about our capacity to figure out what the just response is. Can you say just a little bit more? Yeah, I guess I think that what's epistemically valuable about what you've um, given us here, as I see it, is that it doesn't, it has no commitment to tracking truth because one of the thing, one of the truths of the sort of lowercase d democratizing this judgment is that like. We don't all share, uh, you know, true capital T right. truth, right? Yes, that's right. We have we hold individual lowercase right. teachers. I don't right. know why I'm making so many between <laughs> uppercase <laughs> <laughs> and lowercase, but uh, it's just how it's working my brain. And so that maybe like part of the episode value of that is to say that anything that is seeking a capital T truth is kind of like problematic in that it's not episodically egalitarian enough or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I think so. Yes, um, I do think that. There's um, that that activity is going to be complicated and inaccessible in a particular way, and is not going to travel neatly across domains. There's going to be lots and lots of questions that are not going to be true. That so there's a way in which it does violence to particular types of interpretive communities. There's also a way in which it just doesn't speak to the reality of what political decision making looks like. Um, I think that you just briefly spoke to a question that I've been like yeah. fumbling with for the last like 15 yeah. minutes, but it's the uh, um, presupposition that epistemic egalitarianism um, has that uh, that each person as knowers um, have a common grammar um, by which they can make sense of their experience, mm -hmm. um, and as such also have equal access to the common pool of knowledgeable resources to be producers of that knowledge, to be contributors to that knowledge, and as such, um, you know, in some way, um, you know can help to determine common social uh, knowledge production and practice. And I'm wondering, you know, as I'm drawing on, say, Miranda Fricker's work on epistemic injustice from a, a hermeneutical perspective, in which people don't have access to and are actually erased from the common view of knowing and being knowing subjects. So I'm wondering, you know, does epistemic egalitarianism um, in this sense sort of elide the fact that Individuals as knowers and um, and as and knowing subjects are oftentimes um, not sort of taken into view. The, um, the, the idea is that it's supposed to speak to that. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be responsive to that very what I think of as a very serious concern. So when I'm talking about equal respect for judgment, it's by virtue of the fact that there are whole communities whose judgments are I think considered to be really systematically inferior. I think that. Yeah. That's why I think that this is better marked. So it's partially in response to this epistemic injustice literature. Okay. Yeah. Where it's intended to be. Yes. Hi. Um, I think my question is similar to the one two questions ago, but like in a way that coincides the theory and so that phrases it. Um, so if I understood you correctly, it was that the sort of epistemic value that people have in a jury is that they have insight into community norms and they apply those in the reasonableness standard, or in the case of constitutional interpretation and interpreting constitutions. Is that right? 
um, that there's that. I'm sorry. But there are these community norms that okay. members of the community have insight to, and it's that insight that sort of um, justifies our relying on them to make decisions in civil cases and in constitutional interpretation. Okay, yeah. Um, the problem is those community norms, I think, can oftentimes be unjust or oppressive yes. or wrong in many ways. True. Um, and so I think, you know, from my point of view, it seems that what we would probably want is these decisions to be, like, correct or just or, you know, non-oppressive. Um, and so I think there's a danger in relying on community norms. What will we do if, you know, we disagree yeah. heavily with those yeah. community norms? Especially in constitutional interpretation. To take one example, I think many times in the past, and maybe even today, a majority of people would probably think flag burning is not free speech and should yeah. be outlawed. Yeah. Um, and so, I guess my question is, how do you deal with? Yeah, this yeah, stuff? yeah. And this is also this question. This comes back to the question about jury nullification. Um, so, um, the question—I'm sorry—I've I've sort of lost my train of thought. The question was on the first point of it. I'm sorry, can you restate just because um, had So, well, how would you handle cases where the community norm uh, is unjust, unjust, is unjust or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry. Okay, so on the one hand, I think we do have to accept that community norms are likely to be unjust, are, are going to be at points unjust. And so we, we can, I think we can task a jury with the determination of what these unjust norms are and hope that the experience, this experience of having to identify these norms helps to make vivid for them what the real consequences of the norms are, which itself can have uptake in terms of legal reform more generally. So it's a way in which we can we have a real confrontation with that in the first place. Secondly, again, there's a whole story about what what the fact that this is the way in which democratic decision might be justified doesn't mean that it also is a belief in that which is why I've been sort of I have not wanted to get into that very much, but I, my response there is the same one that I would provide to Lenny, that there might be grounds for legitimate civil disobedience on this model. But to get to that, we have to first identify what these norms are. I think operating as a citizens don't actually have access to the content of what these standards are, are not are not agents of the identification are not agents with respect to these standards, including in the constitutional domain, is a way just to reify these standards. So the idea is that identification is not supposed to it's not supposed to say and and it's a good thing too that this standard is. However, if we thought that there was no set of that we did not actually have standards, that there were not a set of community ones that that bound us, I think we would be in a very dangerous situation of arbitrariness. So we do have to have some anchoring standards. It is the case that these standards are going to fall short and are going to, be, are going to require revision. But it is not the case that we would be better off just throwing up our hands. Yeah, um, I'm very much in agreement with you, but I'm curious how do you respond to the issue of practicality in terms of, um, especially in criminal cases, but also in civil cases, um, the weeding out very often of, of all kinds of jurors who might be controversial, who might know too much, who might be more expert. And unfortunately, a situation where too often you go to the lowest common denominator of the jurors and where you are getting almost prejudice in terms of how yeah. judges can decide. So the problem of leveling down in a way that if yeah. we can instantiate egalitarianism, we're going to level down. Um, I do, I, I, I recognize that as a concern. Um, I think that that treating people as equals does entail um, trying to be neutral, broadly neutral with respect to, to individual level competence, which is and being as inclusive as possible with respect to that competence. That's why I brought up the Elizabeth Anderson response, which I find sort of compelling. Is the art so the argument might be well if we bring competent if we say that we're treating everybody with equal respect for the judgment or we're having this more inclusive process are our outcomes going to be inferior? Again, I think if I were adopting a wholehearted <coughs> random selection model of what legislatures look like or advocating referendums for all sorts of um, decisions. Decision of advocating for democracy in the districts of domains, I think I would be more vulnerable to that concern. 
I do think we have to believe that citizens are at least capable of judging those people who are going to be able to identify these standards and or, and this is a separate issue, advocate for their own interests in particular ways. Um, so their judgment, so we have to believe that citizens are going to be the best judges of these sorts of, are their own best judges with respect to these matters. If we don't believe that, then I think we're, then I think Larry Kramer's right, then we're really down in our aristocratic path. But I do think ultimately that representation solves some of those problems. Do I think that we require uh, judicial supremacy for epistemically to, to make sure that we get the answers right? I don't. I don't. Yeah, I had a question that maybe kind of pushes on this, what happens if the norm, community norms themselves are oppressive. And I guess I'm worried that there's a little bit of a vicious cycle being set up whereby there's something that you, early on in the talk, you know, you said we're going to bracket the fact that often and definitely, often in the present and definitely historically, um, the standard of reasonableness has been incredibly exclusionary. Yeah. So I guess I'm worried about this vicious cycle where that historical and to some extent present uh, reasonability being exclusive and the fact that community norms might be oppressive just creates this cycle where there's never a possibility to develop a standpoint that can be critical of community norms. And at, but at the same time, I'm entirely with you on the, we want to respect people's um, capacity for judgment and not go down a you know judicial supremacy route. So I'm kind of wondering, uh, you know, what epistemic and or institutional methods could be built in or yeah. might we find to offer the ability to get to that critical yeah. standpoint on community norms? Yes, so my argument is ultimately that we are much better accepting a degree of instability in our norms via frequent, via reliability and majority of procedures than we are entrenching these norms. And that a critical first stage though entails having citizens and their legislators engaging this activity of ident of, again of identifying these steps. We're never going there might be norms there that are out there that are oppressive, but which we are not we don't even cognize. You know, we're not if we don't feel the bite if the majority for instance doesn't feel the bite of them, they're not gonna recognize that they're oppressive. And so there needs to be you know, of course there needs to be what other sorts of institutional checks, this is, you know. But this activity, I think, of in an iterated process, identifying what these norms are, interpreting them, and then having the capacity for dissenters to say, no, we find these norms oppressive, is our best, is our best bet long term to get to a more just society. Is it the case that a majority then is going to be instantiated norm that's going to be unjust? Absolutely, but I think there's no, there's just no way around that. I think we have to accept that, that ultimately procedures are going to yield unjust outcomes some of the time, but locking in, but hoping that some sort of substantive account of democracy, for instance, in which we're, we're focusing primarily on the identification of a set of norms, leaves us vulnerable to when these norms are interpreted in ways that are going to be substantively unjust or end up shifting the power entirely to, for instance, in the Dworkinian model, to a judiciary, and losing, as Jeremy Waldron and many others have pointed out, the respect for citizens that we should, in terms of their political agency, to Dr. Carroll's language, that we, for which we wanted to give them rights in the first place. Can I just clarify, because I was a, a little bit distressed with your reply to, well, um, David Nagy's question about these community norms, it almost seems as though you're defining justice in terms of democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, you, can, you say it can be unjust, but what could that mean? What do you mean by that? I, if yeah. if in, the, in the jury case, you're certainly defining justice in a certain way, it's coming out of a democratic procedure. Is this a totally communicative ethics deliberate point of view? It's not supposed to be. It's but how is it not? It's supposed to be, it's supposed to say to be the claim that the justified procedures may yield unjust, substantively unjust outcomes. How do we know that they're unjust? What? You know, if says over says, says, says on my model, the person who's subject to them and the dissenters from the, the from the verdict in an iterate and again in an iterated sort of way. So they say that decision was wrong. We reconsider that decision. There's an activity, you know, there's political activities around the revision of laws. 
That's what it's. That's the way it's supposed to work. It's not the. It's not to say that democracy and justice are the exact same thing. Or that but it is to say that decisions are given their justifiability by virtue of set of procedures. But again, legitimacy and justice are going to come apart here. That doesn't mean the political obligation. But again, that's a different sort of political. Do you obligation. have an account of justice. I don't have a robust account of justice here. So my, this question might get to some of this. One of the features of a, of a um, civil jury that you spoke a little bit about was the preponderance of evidence standard. So uh, you know, that matters quite a bit if you're on a civil jury as to whether or not uh, you're, you're evaluating or making judgments with respect to preponderance of evidence or with respect to a higher standard. And it strikes me as uh, the case that the reason for why you might want a higher standard in certain instances is that the, the gravity of the case is such you want to you want to restrict any possibility, or you want to uh, tighten yes. the uh, judgment such that they they are given perhaps I don't want to use the word truth here, but that they uh, better align with the right outcome. So I would think that with constitutional interpretation, you would want some kind of standard that's higher than yep. preponderance of evidence that's a feature yes. of civil juries. Yes, true. And that was part of the, the defeasible majoritarian procedure thing. So it is, it is the case that I think we want to act. So ordinary legislation, I think we want to distribute the risk um, the risk of creating, um, we want to sort of, uh, to say erroneous decision making, it, it, you know, is wrong. But uh, um, we want to distribute the biases, let's say, in favor of protecting the status quo and creating new legislation very equally. I think the more fundamental the norm, all the way up to the most fundamental civil and political rights, I think we want to distribute the biases. Um, much more unequally in favor of the protection of uh, fundamental of these fundamental rights. It does not mean that these fundamental rights ought to be utterly immune from revision. There are all sorts of consequences for norms once they're interpreted, or unintended consequences, or or the view that they could be more expansively formulated. That's precluded if we entrench them, if we make them really, really hard by the American Amendment procedure to alter. Um, so it's ratcheting it back from where it is in terms of the, bias, the status quo bias somewhat, but I'm not suggesting that we should go all the way down to the equivalent of preponderance of evidence or majority of evidence with very, very weak status quo bias. So it's now after 6 o'clock, so I think it's time uh, for me to invite everyone to a reception to continue yeah, the conversation. 5200. 5200. And please join me in thanking Professor Schultz.